six years, 22 countries, close to 200 scientists, and one exceptional research vessel. The Global Reef Expedition is on a mission to study coral reefs around the world. Coral reefs are undergoing a worldwide crisis, and we're trying to understand where the healthiest reefs remain, what sort of factors make those reefs healthy, and reefs that have been degraded, how we can help them recover and persist into the future. To do so, expedition scientists conduct a number of studies in the field. We're applying a standard protocol that was developed through a consortium of scientists and we think this will be incredibly beneficial to the world of science and management of resources because now we can truly scientifically compare one reef to another from one region to another. We operate under this banner of science without borders. It's basically because there are no political boundaries between the ocean. It's all connected. And what you do in one location can affect another location. Every country we go to, we work with the government agencies and whatever universities are there to identify local participants. And we bring them out with us, first to get them to places that they can't normally get access to, second to show them what we're doing, we try to provide training to them so that they pick up some of our methods and carry it on. It's a two-way street because the local knowledge is immeasurably important to our research and then the local scientists benefit by interacting with world-renowned scientists from very prominent universities and organizations. What every single country says is that their biggest limitation to really enacting sound conservation strategies is lack of scientific information. So our ultimate hope is that the research will influence action on the ground. And so we're acting as a catalyst. We're an accelerant to change. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. And by Divers Direct, inspiring the pursuit of tropical adventure scuba diving. Tahiti, Bora Bora, the islands of French Polynesia evoke visions of an exotic tropical paradise. Located in the South Pacific about halfway between South America and Australia, the island nation is made up of five archipelagos. French Polynesia has hundreds and hundreds of islands and it's spread out in a massive geographical range. It's the size of Western Europe, basically. These islands, some of which have been studied extensively, others have never been surveyed by scientists. And it's really exciting to go research areas that you know for a fact no other human has visited and certainly never conducted any systematic scientific research. We're trying to compare reefs that are in a similar region across what I call gradients of human disturbance. And what I mean by that is going from very populated areas to very unpopulated areas. And it'll help answer a lot of the questions that we have about resilience and how that's related to human impacts. The Global Reef Expedition is organized and funded 
by the Khaled bin Sultan Living Oceans Foundation, a U.S.-based nonprofit established by His Royal Highness Prince Khaled bin Sultan of Saudi Arabia. Prince Khaled became a scuba diver and really fell in love with the ocean, and particularly coral reefs. Well, he was diving in the Red Sea, and he had one reef that was his favorite dive. And so he went back there a couple of years later, and he saw the deterioration of the coral reef firsthand. And so that really gave him the initiative to do what he could do as a single person to try to help preserve these beautiful coral reefs. In 2011, the Global Reef Expedition got underway in the Bahamas. Since then, a dedicated team of researchers has worked its way across the Caribbean, the Galapagos, and to the South Pacific. In each location, science divers conduct a rapid environmental assessment to collect baseline data. We want to know what corals are there, what fish are there, what the bottom looks like, what other types of organisms are found there. Right now we're on Rangaroa, which is the largest atoll in French Polynesia. And there's about 450 different atolls around the world, and French Polynesia has more than any other country. They have about 85 of them. Atolls are ring-shaped coral reef islands that surround a lagoon. On these atolls, we look inside the lagoon, and we look outside of the lagoon on the fore reef. At each site, the divers work in a 100 square meter area. Dive buddy teams collect different types of data. One team collects information on fish. We lay a 30 meter transect line. This is attached to us as we swim along the reefs. As the divers work their way along their transect lines, they identify and count all of the fish species they see within a four meter radius. We try to do as many as we can. Typically, we would be able to cover maybe four transects during one dive. Around Rangiroa, we find a lot of sharks, which is typical for the area. At the same time, we also find a lot of herbivores, such as surgeon fishes and rabbit fishes or parrot fishes. These species occur in large schools that swim around the reef, and they're also very significant. They have very important roles on the reef. Another team of divers is conducting benthic surveys, which means they are studying what lives on the sea floor. I lay out a 10 meter long transect line, and every 10 centimeters I record what's directly underneath that point. And I do this to accurately record what's on the bottom of the reef. And that helps us determine how much of it's coral, how much of it's sand, how much of it's algae. And then we do this at different depths on every single reef multiple times. And then that really helps us to assess what each reef looks like. And then the third survey approach focuses specifically on the corals. And we again use a transect. We lay out a line that's 10 meters long and we assess every coral that's within one meter of that line. So we're looking at a 10 square meter area. And for all these corals, we'll identify what type of coral it is. We then measure its size. And then we record information on how healthy that coral is. By measuring size, it gives you information on the current status of that reef, the past history of the reef, and the direction it's likely to go in the future. And so an ideal reef would be one that has a lot of different species together, and it also has a wide range of sizes. Other divers conduct what are called photo transects. To do so, they use a one square meter quadrant made from PVC pipes. And we'll put that quadrant down and we just flip that over 10 times and take 10 pictures. Because we're limited on time, you can only do so many belt transects in there. We get the same information from these quadrats. We can get cover and we can get size of the corals. The 
the reason we collect all this data is because the more you know about the reef, the better you can manage the reef. We know that one of the major factors responsible for the global coral reef crisis is climate change. Seawater is getting hotter than it's ever been before, and so it's causing corals to bleach and die. Storms are getting more intense. There is a growing threat from where the oceans are getting much more acidic. That's a global problem that it's, it's hard for reef managers to really tackle. But while that's a problem, what they can do is make sure that other factors aren't a problem to the reef. We address a lot of those if we improve water quality in areas where a lot of people live, if we address some of the fishing pressure issues, if we do coastal development in a more environmentally friendly way, I think we can reduce those human impacts and make the reefs more likely to persist in light of climate change. Fortunately for French Polynesia, its coral reefs are doing fairly well compared to reefs in other parts of the world. While they have been impacted by coral bleaching, intense storms, and other natural factors, human impacts are very low. One of the biggest challenges to marine research is access to remote locations. Conducting research at sea is very expensive, which is why many areas are understudied. To make the Global Reef Expedition possible, Prince Khaled bin Sultan donated the use of one of his yachts. The 220-foot MY Golden Shadow. The Golden Shadow really has an amazing suite of capabilities. There is a large stern elevator that operates on hydraulics and that stern elevator can lower right down in the water and its purpose was to recover and launch a Cessna caravan seaplane and that 12 ton stern elevator can also be used to launch some of the bigger tenders, the, the dive boats that we use. The principal dive boat is a 36-foot catamaran that we can put up to 18 scuba divers to do our surveys on the coral reefs. The ship has a very large dive locker where we can fill our dive tanks and in the event of decompression sickness, we have a recompression chamber which really is useful when we're in remote locations of the world and we don't have medical facilities readily available. Also, one of the assets of the ship is extremely long endurance. And so we can travel about 10,000 miles with one filling of fuel, which allows us to access remote areas of the world in recent years, many of the traditional funding sources for scientific research, such as large government grants, have declined. I'm seeing more and more private individuals start to engage in things like oceanographic research. So when you see these foundations stepping up and filling this void, it's very encouraging. Another important aspect of the Global Reef Expedition involves the creation of large-scale maps of the sea floor. And the way we do that is we start to acquire satellite imagery about a year before we come to the location with the ship. So that's a very long process to acquire pictures of the Earth which aren't confounded by clouds. It's a very high resolution and new satellite and the imagery allows us to differentiate the character of the seafloor so we can separate seagrass from coral from sand to all the typical benthic habitats you find in a coral reef environment. The mapping project is spearheaded by Dr. Sam Perkus and his team from Nova Southeastern University's Oceanographic Center in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Once they have all the high resolution images of an area in hand, they begin ground truthing on location. 
we come into the field on the ship to start to relate what the satellite's seeing from orbit to what's really happening on the coral reef itself, on the seafloor. We can then start to get even finer resolution differentiating between areas of coral which are live and vibrant and healthy versus those which are in not such good shape or perhaps even completely dead. So we can make a snapshot, large scale, regional scale audit of the state of the coral reef at this point of time. One of our primary instruments is an acoustic depth sounder, and that's this instrument here. And he is set up so that he can swing into the water, as I'm doing now. And this instrument pings a couple times a second as we're moving along. And you see he's pinging quite quickly right now. And right now it's about 14 meters deep. And here you can see the surface. It's quite flat, so that tells us that we're over sand. Here you have the position, the latitude and longitude of each depth sounding as it's being recorded. So what I'm getting ready to do is to drop this uh, camera into the water. It's a high resolution video camera with a weight on the bottom and a fin to keep it stable on 50 meters of cable. So what we can do is we're going to lower this into the water down to the just above the seafloor and fly it along. The camera is linked into a very accurate GPS at the back of the boat so we know exactly where it is and the bearing and the speed that it's flying and that's the, the information that we're collecting to validate what we see from the satellite. Sam, when you're ready. All right then, neutral. Here we go. How's that, Jeremy? Hold there. Holding. We can see where we are on the satellite image live and we can see the video feed coming from the tethered camera on the seafloor as well. So we know exactly what's going on. All right, done. Coming up. Okay, that's done. The last piece of the puzzle is we have a very low frequency acoustic sounder and we use that to examine what's going on beneath the seafloor itself so we can see how thick a coral reef framework is and that gives us some idea as to whether if we see a reef today which is not very healthy we can see how well that reef has been faring over the last 10 to 6 thousand years of growth and then we can see whether it's anomalous whether the reef today is unhealthy or not or really is it just a, not a very good area for a reef to be developing The technique of mapping the ocean floor from satellite is routinely used, but not at this scale. Typically, we look at areas of 100 square kilometers or so per year. We're now covering 25,000 square kilometers. And so these are the largest applications of the technology to date. And that's very exciting to be involved with. When all the field work is done, the scientists work up their data at the university's lab in Fort Lauderdale. That's a fairly lengthy process involving computer programming and sort of mathematical manipulation of the data set. Using a variety of different computer programs, the experts link the depth values collected in the field with the light values depicted in the satellite imagery to create accurate bathymetry or depth maps. We use the bathymetry that we gathered in the field to train an algorithm that then says this amount of light is an estimate for this type of depth. The ground truthing becomes our training set is what we call it. So this says we know in these areas this is what's here, this is the water depth, and from this now I need to extrapolate to all these other polygons and pixels in my area to make sure that I'm um, estimating things properly. Our field efforts tend to be intense because we need to get as much information as possible out there to make sure that when we come back and do the statistics and the math, we have a strong set coming out. The team also creates habitat maps by assigning groups of pixels in the image to different habitat classes, such as corals or sand. And in this program, I use the drop cam videos and some of my own knowledge to assign classes in the image. So here I just select a bunch of sand and then classify it. So now 
it's marking it so that I know that he's been called sand. And I do that over different depths so that we have um, quite a range. And here I'll just assign some reef. Using algorithms and a variety of software, the computer can then extrapolate habitat classes for the entire image. It uses spectral values or depth values to then uh, group the pixels together saying this should be a reef, this should be sand, this should be land. What this allows us to do is to use only a few examples from the image itself to classify the entire image. Once the process is complete, the experts have created two kinds of maps that can be combined to make a three-dimensional map of the sea floor. The fantastic thing about the maps is they're digital and they can be uh, tendered to the public through the internet, they can be uh, housed in government computer systems, or they could be printed into very large format posters or, or atlases. You can see there's a bathymetric map on the left, a habitat map on the right. Here on the, the water depth, the red are the shallower areas, uh, with blue being moderate depths and blue being the deepest areas that we can see. And on the right, when the habitat map yellows sands, the reds and oranges are different coral frameworks. Uh, green is algae or seagrass. The data is very powerful because the maps we're producing set a baseline which then can be revisited through time to look for regional scale ecological change. Another science component that will be incorporated into the mapping process is a study of the sediments found on the sea floor. What this is able to kind of show us is a, is a spatial pattern. You can make sediment maps using the sediment composition data set. So we're able to map the different gradients of sand and how they are correlated with the coral cover, algal cover, and any sort of storm disturbance. Nova Southeastern University graduate student Alexandra Dempsey collects sediment samples on each dive. We try to sample around three to five vials of sand. Collecting sediment on a coral reef is a little bit like taking a blood sample for a human. With a blood sample you can tell the condition of the body and the, the health and so on and so forth. A coral reef by the way it grows and decays, it produces sediment. And by collecting that sediment, we can start to understand the history of the reef. It may seem like a rather mundane thing to sample, but we can gather great insight about the coral reef and its history by examining it. When we return back from the field after collecting sediment samples, we go ahead and we wash them and dry them in this lab, and we run them through this machine called a cam sizer. What a cam sizer does is measure each individual grain to the shape of the grain, its actual dimensions and area, and it's able to tell us what percentage of the sample is a certain grain size. You can tell a lot by how large the grain sizes are in a sediment sample, where they come from, if they're from a specific type of coral or from an algae or from sponges. Alexandra can also take a closer look at sediment samples under a microscope to better understand what may have happened in a certain area over time. If most of the reef is dead and we really don't have an explanation for it, we can go ahead and look into the sediment sample and you can see what factors have contributed to the downfall of that specific site. One of the big threats to the reefs in French Polynesia is crown of thorn sea stars, which can eat large amounts of coral in a short amount of time. If we can see crown of thorn spines, we can say that's one of the factors or the main contributing factor to why a reef is no longer healthy. All of the data collected on each mission is combined into a geographic information system that is available online. And that is also handed to the country itself. So we're trying to provide them all these geospatial tools that they can then use to implement conservation. The Global Reef Expedition is really only the start of things. We're gaining great advanced knowledge of how these ecosystems function and how healthy they are, but People will be able to use 
these data, I say hundreds of years in the future. I really hope this research that we do and, and all these resources that we're providing to the country, that they're going to be used. That these maps can help create better management for the reefs and that the reports we give them helps the local stakeholders here know their reefs better and therefore protect them better. We've had a few success stories already where some of the science that we've collected, they needed the information in order to take some sort of conservation step. That's what's really rewarding. When I see that we've done this work, it's good information for them, but when they take the next step and then do something that's really gonna protect these reefs for the future. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. And by Divers Direct, inspiring the pursuit of tropical adventure scuba diving.